So, welcome to the belated uh, second round. Uh, we start with, with Arthur Ovaska, who is a professor at uh, Cornell University. He is a director of the bachelor program, and he has been teaching there since the 80, 1983. Uh, he studied there, and he was also a student of Oswald Matthias Ungers, and went, which will be part of the debate after his lecture, which was, he was part of the team to go with Matthias Ungers to Berlin for the so-called Summer Academy. It was an interesting team, uh, mostly with Peter Riemann, who is also in the discussion um, after Ovaska's lecture, and uh, Hans Koloff. So we felt already something of the memories in the first round. Um, Koloff was, as he told, uh, studying at the Cornell University and became also an assistant of Colin Rowe. I think that's also an interesting part of the history that will be not a theme for today. But together with Matthias Ungers, they went to Berlin and taught there the summer academy, mostly with foreign students. Um, we ended the first round with uh, Rob Kier and Hans Koloff talking also about teaching. And I think this is the very moment to hear of Artu Ovaska how it was uh, that Ungers did this job at Cornell University. Um, I put the show together um, mainly because I began to realize that there are a whole um, generation of students that don't really know much about Congress, at least in America, uh, where I am right now, and that, and that uh, Matthias Unger's, uh time that he spent um, in America at Cornell was a very concise time, but probably a very important time in terms of a, a kind of transition in his work. Um, and it was also a very intense time. Um, so I've tried to put together some things just to sort of demonstrate um, some of the important ideas of Ungers. Who you see here, he looks right there. On my screen, he looks very distorted. But, um, um, and I ran across this um, text, um, which was for the uh, 125th uh, anniversary of the Technique Berlin. Uh, in which uh, Ungers was given an on honorary doctorate. Um, and a couple of the things that I found in this text I thought were very important uh, to understanding the work of Ungers and how he uh, sees things and how he teaches. And mainly the concept of variety and unity is very, very important. And uh, the sense that the chorus suggests a common law. In other words, an idea of a larger form than an uh, individual entity like a building is very important. And I think I'll show some um, projects later that demonstrate that. Um, I'm keeping this pretty much to uh, the Cornell years, plus or minus. Uh, a few because I'm going to show some older projects that um, um, have to do with perhaps why Matthias may have come to Cornell. So these are sort of some images of Cornell in the uh, 70s, the beginnings of the computer lab, etc. Unger started the computer lab at Cornell uh, or supported it under Donald Greenberg uh, and some um, 
quick sort of student projects done by Stephen Foreman, David Diamond, and so on. Um, those particular projects were projects that were probably influenced by some of the undergraduate uh, studies that people had had at places like Cooper Union or wherever that might have been, been or uh, Hans went to Karlsruhe, uh, Peter Riemann went to um, Braunschweig. Uh, and the program of Ungers gathered essentially students from all over the world to do advanced graduate studies. Uh, and that uh, literally had people from, what, 15 students, something like that, from Chile, from uh, uh, Japan, um, Germany, uh, hmm? Canada, uh, Britain, Holland. Uh, Rem Kolhas came in 1972 to, uh, 72, 73 to study with Ungers. Um, the reason I show these two particular slides, I think they incorporate many of the ideas of uh, Matthias. Um, one, on the left, uh, the idea of typology and interpretation, that there can be endless variations of uh, an interpretation of a same, the same thing. Basically, um, a series of diagrams of uh, interpretations of uh, the theme book in, in uh, Corbusier's still life paintings. And on the right, a drawing done by Rainer Jagals, who was a uh, student of Matthias in Berlin, um, who uh, had a book published of his drawings um, after his death. Because while he was a student, he found out that he had terminal leukemia. And um, there was an exhibition planned for, his, um, uh, for an exhibition after his death and a uh, publication of that work. He titled this drawing on the right, Homage to OMU. And what this drawing is about is about any individual entity always being part of a larger order or part of a larger sense, whether one sees that in time or whether one sees that in place. One can obviously see this as representing um, a transformation in time, but also in space. Just a kind, another kind of demonstration of the importance of that and um, I'm sorry my friend Hans left because uh, that this is a, um, a redrawing of that drawing, uh, reversing solid and void and then comparing it to uh, the project that um, Hans and I worked on together for many years in Berlin, which was a transformation in itself. Um, Matthias always used the example of Schloss Tegel in Berlin as the example of working with the condition as found, which you see here, repeated it three times, created an entirely new entity out of it, and created a bridge out of once what once was a um, tower and a wall. Similar thing happens at Cornell, where you had two buildings, eventually the dome is placed in the middle, it becomes a larger complex, the complex has, has things removed from it, and now we have Rem Kohlhaas adding a new piece um, here, which hopefully will be starting construction soon. Um, the interior space. Uh, continuing to develop the idea of typology, uh, similar types, similar themes, but variations on a theme um, that basically a Volkswagen is still a Volkswagen, uh, even when arranged in a sense of order, uh, 
example of uh, the idea of type and um, variation. Uh, I included this one hoping that maybe Matthias would be here because he had his own way of, um, of uh, transforming type. I don't know if uh, Sophia was old enough to remember the 68 Mercedes, but basically the hubcaps were re removed and um, changed into an entirely different kind of entity. Um, the context in which Matthias's chairmanship took place at Cornell completely coincided, and my own studies completely coincided with uh, Richard Nixon's presidency and uh, the Vietnam War. And I think it's very important to put into context what was happening at that time. In Matthias's first year of his chairmanship, the um, student union building at Cornell was taken over by uh, militant black student, students um, armed and so on. So Matthias had basically left um, Berlin under the Technical University of Berlin, Berlin under uh, sort of somewhat hostile circumstances and then another whole wave of that took over um, for different reasons at Cornell. That same sun, summer, I know a lot of students don't exactly appreciate the uh, significance of that these days, but the um, was the first moon landing. Um, an incredible achievement. Um, which I think was in a way a kind of um, a kind of statement of the zeitgeist at the time. Uh, an incredible um, uh, positivity towards uh, technological advances, etc. and anything is possible. Somebody in this room is 37 years old who was born in the moon landing year. Other things that were happening the same, at the same time, uh, Aldo Rossi's Galeratese Super Studios projects, which you've already seen, Woodstock, um, the first mass gathering of uh, counterculture, um, drugs, rock and roll, and so on. Uh, ongoing student protest. Uh, Cornell at the time was closed almost every uh, year. The demonstrations on the Cornell campus um, consistently. Um, you may not remember the Munich Olympics, but you maybe remember them more for um, the Olympic buildings than the um, and the events that took place there in 1972. Um, psychedelic graphics were um, going on, underground comics, um, which we had actually tons of in the office, and um, the heavy white, black and white uh, graphics of these things obviously had their influences on certain kinds of projects. I just want to show, put some faces with a couple of um, names that have been th thrown out. Some of the Team 10 people. Uh, an important book, a couple of important books of the time, Rems and Aldo's and Collins. Um, project that Leon did as a house for Colin. And uh, Colin himself along with Matthias. Everybody seems to be scratching their heads in these photos. Uh, Allison and Peter, uh, Joseph Paul Klaihus, um, Jim Sterling, uh, Stefan Viverka, who was uh, a major figure along with Jurgen Savada in some of these um, summer academies. Uh, Leon and uh, 
Peter uh, Rem at the time, myself at the time. I don't have an old picture of Hans, so he had to get a new one, and Simon. Um, I wanted to show this slide just because I, I worked on this drawing showing these five houses by Simon, um, just to kind of put them in a context in which I don't think they had ever been put before, all drawn together in the same way. Um, variations on type and theme, I think. So quickly, because some of these have been shown, some of the projects that were done um, before Matthias came to Cornell, um, like the house in Mungersdorf, which I also spent a lot of time in. What I probably remember the most was that the stairway had come out wrong during a construction and it didn't have the proper head height. And I constantly hit my head on this stone stair, which didn't seem to bother Matthias. When I think he thought it was funny, actually. I still have a bump in my head. Um, now the project of in Enchada has been shown, but I think it, its real concept of transformation can be shown best in a kind of animated form um, of this kind of transformation from square, circle, and um, triangle to a kind of larger uh, mini urban context. Um, I've just been looking at Aldo van Eyck's um, Arnheim Pavilion recently, and I think there's a similar thing going on there, actually. Um, I had the luck when I first went to Matthias's office in Cologne to, um, for a couple of months, he put me to work redrawing some old drawings, doing axonometrics for projects that uh, had no axon to them. So I got to study these projects that had been done in 1965 and, uh, and create drawings for them, which was an incredible learning experience, I have to say. Especially this one, the uh, Tiergarten Museum, uh, which was all done in incredibly uh, fine line drawing and uh, very difficult to interpret. but incredibly well worked out. Uh, the mattress of Vertel, like Rob mentioned, is an incredibly fine and uh, developed spatial idea of creating these towers um, which contain the sort of serving spaces in a kind of Kahnian sense, I guess, uh, versus the served spaces, the more public spaces, which are the L shapes. Um, uh, that are created by these, these bedroom towers, bathroom towers, and kitchen towers, and stair towers, and so on. Um, and Rob mentioned also the, the problem with the height, and the great problem, of course, was that the, uh, the kids that were in the playgrounds down on the ground had a hard time getting back up to their um, apartment to go potty to, you know. So they went in the elevators, right? Um, so that was a great sort of disaster, I think, for Matthias, and um, a kind of a source of embarrassment because it was never really intended to be as tall as it was. Um, this project I show in particular because it begins to demonstrate this kind of fascination of in the, with the urban block, and at the same time, an idea of uh, the transformation of the block, which if you go back to the Yagal's drawing, I think is, is quite clear. Um, but we later did the first of these summer academies um, uh, in Ithaca and in New York on the urban block. This Fiat Ring uh, competition, which, um, which Hans mentioned, 
was the first one that I worked on with Matthias, with Rem together, and uh, Jeffrey Clark. And we teamed up again on this one in um, Bremen. And uh, by the a uh, couple of years ago uh, went by and Rem left Ithaca and went to New York and we um, sort of held a private competition doing the uh, Roosevelt Island uh, project, um, which started off as a, uh, a real competition, but in the middle of it, the Urban Design Corporation of the State of New York went bankrupt and became essentially a kind of ideas competition in the middle. So we transformed our entire project completely to eventually become a kind of um, uh, miniature of the city or a city in the city, um, which is, you know, I guess this is a very well-known, um, you know, a project, but just trying to show a little bit of how it developed. As here you see on the island next to the island of Manhattan in comparison to Central Park. So the idea of microcosm, macrocosm, the Russian doll, etc., the urban villa is all developing quite well together in this project. Um, and we worked on the Valrach Waldorf Richards Museum in, in Cologne, next to the, uh, um, the cathedral. I think um, Jim Sterling also worked on that competition. Um, I remember sometime during that competition, Matthias saying something about this being a big animal crawling in the water, out of the water. So, um, um, you know, this was one of the metaphors he was working with. Matthias drew this elevation, as I remember, um, as one of the ones that we, we sat together long hours on. Um, some of these other transformation projects appear, um, I think, after I moved to Cologne um, in the uh, Schloss Morschbeuch, which uh, was a project, kind of a perpetual project that went on for years, this um, transformation of this um, ideal Schloss uh, with a moat uh, and the uh, addition on it, which was the transformation of the existing stables. Um, I think it was an on-again, off-again project that went through endless kind of stages of um, transformation. Um, was never built, as I know, something was built there, right? No, okay. I thought something was, but I think this was actually the final design stage. Um, just another little known project probably that somehow might show how um, Matthias would approach a triangle would be to make it a square and cut it off. Um, and uh, one of the collab couple of the collaborative projects that uh, Hans and I worked on while I was in Cologne and uh, Hans was in Ithaca and Matthias was flying back and forth and would bring sketches back and forth. The, uh, the Spandau Doppelhaus and the Hotel Berlin. Um, the idea of the house in the house uh, is appearing in that one. Um, maybe another lesser known one here. This is uh, one of the last projects that I worked on was this um, hotel near the zoo in, in Berlin, um, where the concept um, was a pure extruded section. Um, so essentially the, the, <coughs> the concept was um, a rotated section, which you tend to see 
quite a bit now with um, computer graphics that people are doing those sorts of things and uh, computer do tends to do them very differently. Um, beginnings of ideas of the uh, urban garden showing the house in the house which eventually uh, came to its fruition I believe in the uh, German Architecture Museum uh, which I still think today is in my opinion the most the clearest statement of um, of uh, some of Matthias's concepts um, just a couple of quotes um, on the first project I was working on Matthias was flying back and forth quite a bit and he um, had just gone, flown through New York where um, Louis Kahn had been found dead in the men's room in Penn Station. And um, Matthias was devastated by this news. Um, after we won the first prize in the um, Vierte Ring, the fourth ring competition, uh, Matthias was ready to pack his bags and move back to Berlin uh, in 1974. Uh, the expectation was that this uh, Pieter Ring project would, would completely change our lives, but that didn't happen. Nothing ever happened with it. This one I think is kind of important. Um, I remember having a conversation with Matthias um, and it was at, at the same time it was about uh, Leon Creer's drawings of phone booths in the Royal Mint competition and some of his drawings that he had done with Sterling and suddenly looking at, what, at the um, axonometric of the um, Leicester Engineering Building and noticing that the um, that the uh, chimney in that drawing looks exactly like a mechanical pencil and we started talking about some of those things and Matthias all of a sudden said that's what it's all about it's taking something banal and making it into your own which I think in some way explains something about the square um, because Matthias seems to have done that, I think. Um, another uh, quote which I remember clearly that, uh, you know, I think offends some people, um, but I think uh, Matthias clearly had an idea that um, that uh, design, design is the locomotive. Um, <laughs> um, this was kind of what would happen when, um, when certain people would come to the office. Everything would have to get hidden. I don't know if that included Rob. Um, it definitely included Joseph Kalaihus and another quote about Kalaihus. Um, and another famous one that he was uh, uh, bounced around in the press for in 1976 uh, at, just at the beginning of the first um, Summer Academy uh, this was sort of his opening statement, actually, uh, at the Idiot said in Berlin, that you can think or you can build, but you can't do both at the same time. And this is just a, uh, a personal one. Um, he couldn't believe it that my son was actually conceived during the uh, Hotel Berlin competition. 
and I, I don't know how it happened either. <laughs> so, that's it. And uh, now I guess Peter and I will talk about the some academies. Uh, you want me to, you want me to leave that? Sure, yeah. Um, now that was a very nice presentation. Uh, you mentioned um Bezüge zu seiner Arbeit findet Ungers vor allem auch in der Kunst, in Gemälden und Plastiken, in Werken, die ihn anregen und inspirieren. Aber man kann natürlich nicht alles, was einen beflügelt, mit nach Hause tragen. An Orte oder Plätze, die ihm wichtig sind, muss er immer wieder selbst hingehen, wie zum Beispiel nach Klinike in Berlin. Hier an der Havel hat Schinkel Anfang des it's interesting that um, you mentioned the architectural museum as a strong project, mm -hmm. the, the Deutsche Architectural Museum in Frankfurt. Before you came, we, show, we showed a fragment from a documentary um, of the VDR of the 1980s. And what is interesting is that um, um, uh, in all the things we are going to discuss now, that there are some themes uh, apparently at the Cornell, from the Cornell time, and how you learned about it and how you participated in it for you, the Deutsche Architektur is uh, an example. For Ram Kolas, who was part of your crew, um, he starts to talk more and more about uh, his uh, working together with Oswald Matthias Ungers and for Arch Plus, which is the magazine that uh, comes out in Germany and that did a kind of remake of the catalog of our exhibition here, learning from OM Ungers. Um, Kolas wrote a contribution. Uh, did you read it? To the article. His article? Uh, interesting enough, it, it ends again with uh, Schinkel and Schloss uh, Glienicke. Mm -hmm. And that's why I thought for our discussion it's quite interesting to, to, to listen at Ungers, what he was saying about that. So the romantic music is just part of the documentary, but he appears later on. So let, let's have a look on this. It's only uh, two minutes. Schinkel Anfang des 19. Jahrhunderts für den Prinzen Karl von Preußen eine Schloss- und Parkanlage entworfen. Wenn Trier ein gewachsener Ort ist, ein Ort, an dem sich Geschichte allmählich entwickelt hat und zu einem Gesamtgefüge zusammengefügt hat, dann ist Klinike ein gesetzter Platz. Da sind die ganzen Ereignisse kult verschiedenen Kulturen, verschiedenen Möglichkeiten der Interpretation eines Themas zusammengetragen. Man äh, sehe sich zum Beispiel die, das Thema Brücke, Wasser, Wasserbrücke, diesen Ablauf an, der in Klinike im Park so eindrucksvoll dargestellt wird. Die Brücke, die zunächst einfach nur ein ein ganz simples Naturelement ist, dann zu einem Steg wird, schließlich zu einer gespannten Brücke mit Bögen oder aber zu einer Brücke, die höchste handwerkliche Kunst voraussetzt. Und schließlich endet das Wasser im See. Das 
Das gleiche Thema findet man dann bei der Säule in Trinity. Von dem einfachen Baumstumpf über den Säulenstumpf, über den Säulenfuß zur Einzelsäule, der in Analogie zum Baum gestellt wird, zur Säulengruppe, die zur Arkade wird oder aber schließlich zur Säule, die eine menschliche, durch eine menschliche Figur dargestellt wird, deren Haartracht ein Dach ist, oder aber die höchste Stufe der Säule dann, die nur noch als Illusion, als eine Darstellung, als Bild auf der Wand erscheint und damit wieder zu einer äußersten, extremen Umkehrung des ursprünglichen Themas darstellt. Alle meine Entwürfe, die Transformation, die morphologische Verwandlung, die Vielfalt in der Einheit, die Unterschiedlichkeit im gleichen Thema, alles das ist eigentlich in Klinike dargestellt, kommt von Klinike und hier kriege ich, bekomme ich die Anregungen zu diesen Möglichkeiten, architektonische Ideen, architektonische Themen zu interpretieren, anders darzustellen, weiterzuführen. So. Conclusion, but we will not start with a conclusion. Conclusion of Rem Kolas, everything is in Glienicke, the same conclusion, Ungers. So, clear enough election of Matthias. Um, before we go into details, I think it's quite important to know that there are three topics in which both of you were involved, um, which is the urban villa, the urban garden, and the city in the city. And these are three publications, you see them also in the exhibition, and you see works from the students and uh, from the period in the exhibition. And that's where we want to focus on in this round. And I think it's quite important that both of you maybe first explain a little bit more about what is this about, the villa, the urban villa, the urban garden, and the city in the city. Um, I didn't introduce Peter Riemann so properly, but he is an architect now in, uh, in Bonn. He studied at the Cornell University. Actually, he finished his studies after he teach, taught with Matthias in Berlin, I think. He did finish your studies in 77. Yeah, I went back to, I went back to, I went back to Cornell and, and finished my thesis. So I'm only one of the few who really did end up as master. But uh, can you explain a little bit more about what, I mean, maybe we go in the right order, no? Yeah, well, the, the right order <laughs> is there was actually one other summer academy that dealt with the urban block and uh, dealt with uh, New York City. Um, and uh, that is sort of, I guess, unrelated, and as far as I know, not not um, exhibited here at all. The ones that are exhibited are the ones that took place in Berlin. And what they all have in common, I think, let me rephrase that, they all took place in West Berlin. Um, and that West Berlin at that time was a very specific entity that <laughs> had to do with a toothless, uh, shrinking city that was walled in. And um, I, I think that is the, the major uh, thing that they have in common, is how does one conceptualize that uh, accidental, maybe not accidental, but you know, conceptually accidental architectural condition, right? Um, I guess it, it is very important. Um, if you look at the catalog um, of the TU Berlin, um, which uh, was done and activated by Erika Mühltaler, um, I think there is also a little bit um, difference in the, in the order. Uh, the, the urban garden was the last Berlin summer 
Academy. So I think for whatever reason it was a little bit changed. Uh, but I agree to you, Arthur, that there are of course a lot of accidents and incidents and lectures and summer schools which were some sort of a preparation for uh, the urban block. So one is Gotham City, which you did with uh, Hans Kolov, I guess, um, in Cornell. Um, I guess also the Roosevelt Island, Island competition, uh, which you've seen um, in Arthur's presentation, um, actually is dealing also with this, uh, he was explaining it, with the city as a miniaturized version of the real city. So it is, and I think this is the, the most interesting thing with uh, uh, working with Matthias, that one gains some sort of um, tools, tools in order um, to be creative and to concept conceptualize. Uh, I think this is another theme uh, which we might um, carry on later. But I think there is no famous summer academy in Berlin with the invention of doing things in Berlin especially and inventing it in that time. So it is what we call the zeitgeist. There are a lot of people working on these, um, not really problems, but on typological things. Um, they are trying to find out uh, what is adequate for a society in that special, uh, spe uh, specific period. Uh, and I think the major change that happened in the first Berlin Summer Academy was that there was uh, that, that there were two topics. The one was the city, which almost had nothing to do with this sort of city within the city. Uh, uh, it's like a schematizing um, and synthetic operation. Uh, in a very specific situ situation, Hans was mentioning that, we had an um, old uh, main city of Germany uh, which was totally fixed to the boundaries. And I think when Ram Kolas uh, came into the picture, uh, I think for him it was interesting because this is, uh, was very surrealistic. So it is, had nothing to do with the historic city, had, had nothing to do um, with the modern city. Uh, so it was something in between. And uh, I think this is uh, one point that the students were working on architecture and at the same time we were doing on the side urban design. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, as I think about it more and more, and I think Rem has said this also, the, um, the, the, the most uh, um, impressive, impressive thing that came out of the uh, Berlin publications, the thing that really struck him was the publication of the uh, Berliner Planmauern, the, the uh, publication of the, the Berlin um, uh, in English, uh, party walls um, that were left exposed after the war. And um, uh, this was, I think, in a way, the, the first um, clear recognition of the concept of uh, absence, I think, or the recognition of, of the potential of absence that um, is, is different from uh, the idea of a, of a um, figural urban void or space. It's absence, it's something which has been there. Uh, Memory-wise, it is there, but it's absent. And I think that is in some way underlying a lot of it also. Um, the two of you, together with Hans Kolov and Rem Kolas, apparently shared a lot of um, experience, but also fascinations. The thing you just mentioned of these uh, walls that were empty remained a topic in the work of Hans Kolov 
Til de 1980s he, he did a, an issue on architecture, uh, nieuwe aanzichten, so no, no ways of looking at architecture, with on the cover such a wall. And um, I think also you shared much more than you share probably today, in, at least in the way you look. Um, to give a... <laughs> We're not back. No, 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 no. <laughs> No, but I remember this just a little sketch. I remember 1976, we invited Rem Kolas here uh, at the university. I was a student assistant and I had to, 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 to keep the slides uh, sharp. And uh, I remember he was wearing the, the same haircut as you, like, like, like I myself at the time. Um, so you looked a little bit alike. And um, <laughs> at the same time, you shared these uh, uh, fascinations. Yeah, you, you're the only one that still has the imprint of that sidecast. Um, the point is that um, um, you, you mentioned, you, you showed the project Spandau Doppelhaus. When we look in the exhibition, the Urban Villa, you were teaching together with uh, Hans Kolov. And we see all these students that made actually variations uh, their own variations, but very much inside of the format of a certain exercise. Maybe a little bit in contrast to what you just said, the absence. It was very much a formal exercise into what can you develop as a villa. And what I'm very much interested in that apparently this kind of double track in the seminars, but also in the work of Matthias himself, of being interested in a phenomenon that's much larger than architecture. Um, and at the other hand, also in this diploma project of Volker Sein, we see the slab, which is a very much a non-object almost, and then these villas around. Reisinger. Reisinger, yeah, yeah. sorry. Reisinger, um, these six villas that um, are in line with what I just mentioned, the, the urban villa, and the, which is much later on, and the, the Spandau Doppelhaus. Um, is it true that you, do you look also back at it, that this was kind of a double thing? Is it related? Is it not important to, to see things like that? Um, well, I, I think if you do a housing project, generally you work from two ends. You work from thinking about the dwelling itself, and you work, think about working on the city at the same time, or the, the larger scale context. And uh, I guess I find it natural to be thinking about both of those scales at the same time. And I, you know, I think it's inevitable that a, a concept, that a, a um, a use of a villa type uh, as opposed to a um, uh, Zeilenbau type or a um, um, block Handbebauung type um, has certain implications that there's a, a, um, a reciprocal uh, concept of what its uh, reciprocal green space would be. No? I think one good example is the uh, pyramus, pyramus and Tispe, right? Yeah. That, that was the uh, sort of metaphorical uh, image or topic for these uh, two houses with a wall in between. Um, and I think this is a very um, easy way to understand um, how Matthias was thinking or how he was doing architecture. This was, I guess, for all of us, um, not only interesting, but we try to find out uh, where does it all come from, the conceptualization. Uh, so we had, we saw the Magritte man. So I think there are always uh, underlying things which has, uh, has to do with um, artistic uh, interpretation. And I think this is also the thing with Glienicke. We all went through this lesson. You know, Matthias took us to, to Glienicke and he explained and everything and so on. And it was very clear to me, uh, at least after 
half a year or three quarters of a year, that it is not what he was always saying or very often saying, architecture as found, but it was architecture as found and interpreted. And the interpretation was doing by an individual. So, and there were a lot of other people, I think, in Lotus, there were drawings by Leon Krier uh, from Glienicke. So, this kind of experience, uh, I think, everybody had who were thinking on this track. Uh, and for Matthias, I think it was very clear that he tried uh, um, to stir the students and to show them um, how you are able to go your own way with this imagination process. And uh, one thing which is also very interesting is his sort of uh, back idea in terms of philosophy. And also this house, Pyramus and Tispe, with two individuums uh, not able to come together because there is a wall in between. There is, was the IDZ uh, symposium where Ungers, um, a lot of people, uh, sort of befuddled because he said, well, there is the Landwehr Kanal, and this canal uh, is at the same time a separation between uh, Neukölln and I don't know what part of the city, and at the same time it combines the two areas. And I think uh, this is the, the uh, Zusammenfall der Gegensätze, so this is what he always talk, was talking about. And I guess this is the mainstream of understanding Matthias and at the same time not only understanding him but also working with him and being able afterwards to somehow work in the same manner. Um, I think there's some, also something, we, you know, before the topic of Glienicke goes away, um, the true experience of the Glienicke lecture, which I I think many people talk about uh, as probably being one of the most incredible lectures they've ever seen, uh, I think always had to do with Matthias's own slides that he had taken. He had personally photographed the whole park and had uh, photographs in fall colors, in autumn colors, that were always absolutely um, breathtaking and much, much more convincing than that kind of pixelized thing. Um, and I think what that brings up is something I, I've been thinking about for a while, and I, I don't think I've really heard it clearly mentioned, but that uh, even in the design stage of a project, that Matthias was working on, he would be thinking of it in terms of a lecture. So the end product was not always quite that clear, whether it would be a building, whether it be a lecture, whether it would be part of an ongoing contribution to a book or whatever. It was, it was ongoing thought and production. Um, the Pyramus and Thisbe House, you know, I have to say, you know, they didn't get that name till afterwards. Right? Um, it was that was a sort of discovery that came after the the fact. But um, but the you know references to you know the two sides of the wall were obvious, right? Yeah. I would like to go further to. Um, I mean, we don't have so much time left, and we should have, have at least one question from the room. Um, but one thing I really want to uh, bring up is that the urban garden and the stad in the stad are in the same uh, summer. No. no? As, I said, as, I said, no. as I said before. Oh. Uh, as I said before, the... Um, urban villa and the city within the city, uh, this was in 77. Uh, the, 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 yeah. the so, and the urban garden, and this is interesting also to see it in the catalog, um, there is 77, there was no real theme or topic for the next summer. And then the urban garden came up in, in Cornell. Okay, I, I mixed up, I'm sorry for that, but 
Uh, wat, is, wat strikt me is dat de urban villa en de stad in de stad, city in the city, are more or less parallel, with a complete different intellectual exercise. One is, like I said, you and Kolov doing these villas with the students, and then apparently, and maybe you, you should say more about that, Ram Kolas is flown in to, uh, to also participate. And when I read the city in the city, the, and we will have a complete round about this afterwards, so we can be very short about this now, but you are a witness, um, both of you, um, about what happened at that time. And you just mentioned that one of the attitudes of Matthias was <coughs> as found but interpreted. Um, when I read this text, you have a completely different uh, approach, which is, which is you find something elsewhere and you bring it in a, another spot. So you, I mean, I don't want to suggest that this is a, a new method. Uh, it can probably be found uh, anywhere, but there's a whole scenario that things are copied from outside and brought to Berlin as a kind of puzzle piece you could exercise with students. Is that, first I would like to know a little bit more about the two versions of that city in the city. Uh, there's one draft uh, with, with Rem Kolas, his name is spelled wrong, with O-L, so probably somebody else typed it, but it's an English uh, a text, and then O.M. Ungers, Peter Riemann. And later on, the number of authors is enlarged, and there's a little different argument there. Um, I think it's easy. Okay, okay good. Yeah, Peter Ovaska shows up from time to time. <laughs> um, yeah. And then there's some mysterious Martin Ovaska that shows up. Also. Um, I think it's easy to explain because um, Rem Kolas didn't actually do any of these drawings, which is not in any catalog. So, so this is not the, uh, the major topic. Uh, but what I found very interesting, and I was talking with Erika Mühltaler um, this morning about the whole thing again, uh, is that obviously there are, I have still the old uh, original version, um, and I was picking up uh, Ram Kolas at the airport, and I'm quite sure that he had in his, not pocket, but in his, um, what is it, uh, bag, uh, some sort of a manuscript, or he was working in that, uh, on that uh, topic uh, on the airplane. And I'm also quite sure that, of course, before he went to Berlin, um, he was talking with Matthias about the whole thing, what was going on and so on. And if one um, is looking at the, uh, the second version, which was done finally in Cornell, um, then one can uh, see the differences that obviously in a lot of cases, Ram Kolas is taking this kind of very specific, uh, not modern city, but the city was wiped out during the war and it has some sort of surrealistic um, entities like uh, the Brandmauer uh, themes or this fancy thing, uh, the wall that is gone down now. Um, and I, I have the feeling that Rem Kohlhaas uh, took this whole situation more in the ironic and surrealistic uh, sense, more dynamic. Uh, then Matthias Ungers was dealing with the, with the whole thing, and um, it shows up at, a, a several, uh, at several um, items. For instance, Rem Kolas was writing in his uh, manuscript that uh, a lot of farmland and a lot of um, wood and uh, almost like jungle would create some sort of an urban tourism uh, with uh, like, like a safari. Uh, so this kind of uh, strange Africa in Berlin um, was not taken over by Matthias because uh, at the same time I think he had a strong feeling about the IBA which was uh, coming or showing up, uh, the International Building Exhibition, and we, he was also doing, uh, uh, making reference uh, to, to political parties like now having some topic for the International Building Exhibition. So I think 
uh, all the ironic and more uh, fancy and I don't know what surrealistic things, they had to uh, be wiped out. And the whole thing, what we see today, uh, is done in, let's say, almost half a year. All the, the drawings and all the, um, uh, what was said uh, by Matthias and then what, what was also published. And of course, everybody was working in it. I was doing the drawings, Arthur and Hans came in the evening, uh, Rem Kolhas, I think he was there only for two weeks and then left. And he was, for my feeling, uh, some sort of, um, it's like having a bottle of kerosene uh, to make the thing fly. Um, I, I was just going to say, you know, I think in, um, in, in, in that project and all three of them, all, all three ongoing projects, right, I, I don't separate them so much, I think um, the conceptualization of a building exhibition was an essential part of it. Uh, Matthias was being um, uh, contracted to do studies um, uh, by the Senate in Berlin for uh, possible ideas for a building exhibition. It was very wide open. There was, there was nothing completely clear. And I think there was a lot of uh, um, brainstorming or conceptualizing about what a building exhibition could be. If you remember that the last one um, had been Hansa Fertel, Interbau in 57, and before that the uh, 1931 uh, exhibition of the new dwelling, uh, there was a certain idea there of the, um, the possibility of a new type being exhibited. Uh, whether this would be the literally the urban villa or the city in the city, these were sort of trials, I think, to see what this could possibly be. And it probably should also be remembered that Matthias was um, director of the building exhibition of the IBA for one day, uh, in which he he then turned it down. Um, before we go to uh, T. Um, can we have, if there is one question, yes? to say um, I was educated as much by Colin Rowe and Colin Rowe influenced people as I was by Ungers and history at least at Cornell was a very important uh, factor in the education of, of an architect um, uh, so you know, what I would have to say about that would be very different, I think, from w whatever um, Hans had to say about it. Um, I think uh, one major point was made by Hans Koloff that he said, uh, I met Werner Göhner in Karlsruhe and we didn't really uh, know what to do. So, and then Ungers came up as the solution. And I think uh, the same was true for me. After the diploma in Braunschweig, there was no orientation. So that couldn't it be all about architecture. And um, I think uh, this lack of continuity, uh, which probably everybody knows that this happened in Germany, yeah, the cutoff of history, anything, uh, that was uh, also felt by my generation. We had professors, uh, they were working in Braunschweig the first years, 
uh, rebuilding the ruins of the technical university and then they became uh, literally uh, professors yeah, by helping out uh, as uh, brick workers. Yeah? Uh, so this kind of shift, I think this was also the to topic of this morning, um, this was sort of over come by Oswald Matthias Ungers, and I think uh, if you have in mind the Leipziger Platz uh, concept by Reisinger, um, this kind of urban square with isolated townhouses, whatever size, uh, is sort of identical with a plan by uh, Franz von Fischer in Munich. So, uh, Rob Creer knows it probably better. I think it was von Fischer uh, who did a square a concept, uh, I've, I've forgotten the name of the square, but so you can find a, a similar situation in, uh, uh, in uh, Rügen, uh, an island. So this is also uh, quite clearly the sort of retroactive manifesto uh, with urban and architectural history coming to Berlin in a, at a time where almost nobody in, in Germany realized it. Can I, can I try to finish uh, our round? Uh, not a big conclusion, but in maybe answering in another way the question. Um, there's another is issue of ARG Plus that shows all the lectures of uh, Oswald Matthias Ungers. And there you see that he is very conscious about history. And uh, what we maybe have learned since this morning is that it was not literally taking the examples of history as a model to, uh, to copy in that period, as it would be in the 1980s of this co uh, paste uh, and copy uh, postmodernism, but it was trying to make an, your own interpretation. It were all observation exercises. Yeah, I, I would. Is that working? I, I would just say to what Hans was talking about. That, that that, in a certain way, applied historically also. Uh, what I found, I think, in, in um, probably about 1974 or 75, that, that we could all be sitting in the studio together looking at anything and everything, and, you know, and it was, there was no obsession about it or no stylistic preference, but, you know, we could be looking at... Um, uh, you know, ancient um, Babylonian ziggurats <laughs> and find them completely amazing. And that was that was one of the things that was incredible about Matthias. You know, there, there was there was he could find something in everything. Maybe then the last question to you. I, I found it quite interesting this comparison between the cartoons, the kind of underground cartoons, and then the project in the drawing style of Roosevelt Island, where you worked on, which is black and white that you suggested, maybe also with the Magritte man repeating all the time, that, that that kind of energy really is coming together in, in, in that kind of project? Is that all, was that also for Matthias, the, the, kind of, the kind of images that came together, or was that your experience? No, that was coming from a, a, a number of different places, places, different people collaborating and working on things at the same time, and, and new things coming together, etc. Okay.